How's everyone doing? How is everyone doing? If y'all are doing good, let me hear you say amen. amen. Come on, somebody. All right, so I'm just going to dive straight into it. Is that okay? All right, awesome. So last week, we were talking about a guy named Gideon, a guy who was literally in the wine press, literally meshing wheat because he was trying to hide in this cave of fear. But God called him out, but what we realize is that he was a reluctant leader. And I think that name or that word reluctance, it actually stuck out to me as I was praying for everyone here, sitting here in this congregation. The definition of reluctant means feeling or showing aversion, hesitation, or unwillingness to get involved. And I feel like this past year or the year of 2020 and leading into 2021, I feel like a lot of us were kind of like boxers getting ready to get into the ring. And then we thought we were going to take on 2021 and it was going to be great. And then out of nowhere, boom, got hit right in the face. And then you got a little disoriented and then you started to get a little hesitant. And when you hesitate, you fail. And I feel like a lot of us kind of got into that place and I feel like there are some Gideons here tonight that God wants to help you actually take your place in society, take your place on your campus, take your place at your workplace. And that's why this, the title for my message tonight is Taking Our Place. And as we continue, we see that Gideon was called to reverse the downward spiral of God's people by leading a charge to replace rebellion with obedience and fear with faith. And as we see Gideon was the most unlikely man to lead a spiritual revival that began with the destruction of idols. And you could see that it would require courageous trust in God because it would mean going against terrible odds. Therefore, he wanted to be sure it was God's will. And with everything going on, with the inauguration of Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris, with COVID-19 still ramping up, with the vaccine coming in, but yet we see the strands being a little mutated, we see that we're still in times where we need to be courageous. We're still seeing times where we need to stand up and be the church. We are still seeing times where we need to stand up and rise up in the face of fear. Amen? Amen. Amen. So now, let's go ahead and start off with prayer, and then we'll get this message going. Father God, we just want to pray that right now for every person that is sitting in here tonight. Every person that became reluctant, every person that might have gotten hesitant, every person like even Jenny was praying that might be struggling with some unbelief and some discouragement, God, we pray that you use me to be able to just impart encouragement and inspiration from your word and from your spirit and reminding them that there is still purpose for their life and in the place of their greatest pain, they will find their greatest sense of purpose. So God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to move in the sanctuary. We pray for every person to be able to rise up after this service and know that they are called to make a difference no matter who they are, no matter what they say to themselves at night. But we know that what you call them is you say you are chosen. So God, we pray that you move through this night and we ask that your will be done in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So first off, the first thing we need to do in order to be able to be like a Gideon and to be able to step into a place of idolatry and to bring a spiritual revival is we need to ask God to confirm where he's leading us. If we look at Judges chapter 6, verse 36 through 40, it says, then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night and it was dry on the fleece only and on all the ground there was dew. If you were here last week, you would have saw that Gideon already got a confirmatory sign from an angel saying that I called you to be a mighty man of valor. And he already got a victory, but when he saw the battle that is to come, he knew that the mission wasn't gonna be easy so he had to confirm God's leading again. There are some people here where God might have gave you a word already and you're walking through it, but you might just need another confirmation. You might just need to ask God saying, God, are you sure you want me to take this job? Are you sure you want me to go to this campus? Are you sure you want me to even move to this country or even step into ministry? It's not bad to ask God for confirmation. God is not offended by your questions. God actually welcomes it, and he wants you to ask. Because you see Gideon said, let not your anger burn against me, because what he saw was there was a fleece. He laid it out, and he said, God, if you're really going to use me, 
an insecure, weak, fearful man, then I'm going to lay out this fleece and I'm going to put dew all over it. And the first sign I need to see is if there's going to be dew on the fleece and everything else is going to be dried up around it. And God said, done. And then Gideon said, okay, okay. You gave me a sign. Let me get one more sign. Let me see if you can do the opposite and flip it. Instead of actually having the dew be on the fleece, let's see the dew be on the ground and the fleece be completely dry. And God did it again. He said, boom, there you go. You got your confirmation. So there are some of us that need to ask God for that second confirmation because he knew that his life was in danger and he needed to know if God was in that decision. There's a lot of us here that are facing big decisions. And we know that there are some things in the Bible, which is the truth, which is the word of God that we don't really need to pray about. Like as in saying, don't commit adultery, don't drink too much, don't, uh, don't lie to your neighbor, don't hate your neighbor, don't hold bitterness, don't hold unforgiveness. Those things you don't need to pray about. But the thing you do need to pray about is, God, who do you want me to marry? God, what do you want me to do with my career? God, where do you want me to go? Do you want me to move from Hawaii and go to another country and bring the gospel? Do you want me to move out of my parents' house because that was a place where my faith was dying and I needed to be faith-filled and I need to take a leap of faith? Or do I need to step out even on my own weakness and see what you're going to do, God? Because see, my question to you here today is, what if you got the greatest opportunity you've ever gotten? And I might even be getting ahead of myself, but I'm just going to say it right now. We're saying, what if your dream job called you and said, you got the job, but what if God said, no? What if the girl or the guy that you were checking out at every 7.45 p.m. service and that guy or girl finally walks up to you and say, man, you're looking kind of good. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're more anointed or something. But I kind of want to go on a date with you. But what if God said, no, not yet? Are you in that posture where you can say no even to something that might seem so good at the moment, but it will actually bring you death in the end? But so as we see where God leads us, it's usually with a fragment of uncertainty. And it's always going to be scary. But what we can be certain in is when God leads us into that ocean of uncertainty, we can be certain that God is going to catch us. We can be certain that God is going to give us a life raft so we can float. God is going to give us what we need to get it done because we know that sometimes you feel the feeling of fear. Sometimes the action has to come first and then the feeling will follow. Sometimes you don't feel like reaching out to your friends. Sometimes you don't feel like reading your Bible. Sometimes you don't feel like praying to God. But once you start doing the action, like you're, like even like when you work out, you start feeling better as you do it. And the same thing is with our faith. When God gives us confirmation, we have to remember that actions of faith cancel feelings of fear, and we need to make sure that we don't hesitate. We just do it, as in D-E-W, do it. And once it's confirmed, we need to allow God to help us move from self-sufficiency to God dependency. Or in other words, let God prune your self-strength so he can reveal his strength. When we look at Judges chapter 7, verse 2 through 7, it says, The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the man down to the water. There the Lord told them, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank the drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands and let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. So right there we see Gideon had 32,000 soldiers right there at his back. He had a lot of homies backing him up but also not realizing that some theologians say that those 32,000 were already outnumbered four to one in regards to the Midianites. But God said, you see this 32,000? I want you to knock out 22,000, and I want to see you just have 10,000. And he said, okay. I mean, I still got some homies rolling with me. I mean, if I get jumped, they'll back me up. But God said, that's still too much. I want you to take these guys to a watering hole, and the ones that lap down and drink the water like a water, those are the men that I'm going to allow you to take into battle. 
Because God said, if you had those 32,000 or even if you had that 10,000, then you'll start saying it was because of my soldiers, because of my strength that I got the victory. But God was saying, I want to make sure that my strength is revealed. And I want to make sure that when I bring the victory, I get the glory for it. And there are some people here today where God might have stripped away some things. And you might feel like, man, did I do something wrong? And God is saying, no, you might not have done anything wrong. I just want to strip all the other idols that were in your life so that you can see that those things were insecure so I could bring the true security, which is me. Because God is saying, it's not your money. It's not your intellect. It's not your certifications. It's not even your college degree or your seminary degree or even all the friends that you have. God is saying, it's just me and I will bring the victory. But when we get pruned, it doesn't feel good. When we get pruned, it's like he's squeezing, he's ripping everything away from us and we have nothing else to hold on to but God. But so we can see that God set the stage by removing Gideon's security blanket of numbers and he wanted to make sure they knew it was totally him in an age where victories were attributed to many gods, including the God of self. Some of you guys might not be feeling so good because God is saying, are you still going to trust me and obey me in your weakness? Because God is saying, in your weakness, I will provide the strength. Because if you feel good all the time and you're just doing great ministry or doing great schoolwork or doing great work work, God is going to say, you're just going to get big headed. You're just going to get prideful. And I'm saying this about myself. That's why I realized that for people who have great callings, they always have to go through great suffering. Because God says the suffering produces the humility, reminding yourself that it's not even you. It's all about God. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 4, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So we can see that God doesn't fight the same way the world does. In the world's eye, 300 men with torches and trumpets seem like a sorry army that anyone would discredit. But that's exactly how God wants it. So we don't get the glory, but he does. And once we start depending on God and stop depending on self, the next step is to take your place to fulfill God's assignment. It says in Judges chapter 7, verse 16 through 22, and he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled when they blew the 300 trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army and the army fled. As we see right here, it wasn't even the soldiers that brought the victory. All they had was trumpets and some torches. Or to me, I kind of pictured it as a whistle. A whistle is not very scary or dangerous, but they had a trumpet and they just blew the trumpet and God allowed the Midianites to actually look against each other and start battling each other and start killing each other. So, that, so God knew that, that he would get the glory from the victory. There are gonna be moments in your life where God is gonna tell you to do something that may not seem like something you would do and it wouldn't make sense, but God is saying when you step in obedience, watch me bring the victory in a way that you can't. When you step in obedience, step onto your campus and just say, God, I'm going to pray for the campus and I'm going to see who comes out. Then you're going to see God move in a way where somebody's going to be like, wait a minute. I was just walking over here and I felt like I felt led to talk to you. Or you're going to go into your workplace and you're going to be like, God, just give me someone that I can reach out to. Or God, let me just step in obedience or let me just be vigilant. And then you're going to see someone say, man, for some reason I had a very tough day. Do you have time to talk? And then that would open up a conversation for the gospel. But it's a way that God is going to bring the victory and going to bring the win himself. And also, we need to remember that God called Gideon a mighty warrior when he was hiding in fear. And we can see that true identity and ability is often clouded with insecurity. Because God knows us and will remove insecurity to reveal our true identity. Speaking about insecurity, a lot of the times the places where we're most gifted at is the place where we're most vulnerable. The places where we are gifted at is usually the place where we are most vulnerable. I mean, I'm not going to lie. For me, when one person told me, even like a few weeks ago, they said, you're a great communicator. I was like, no way. Like something in me just cringed. And I'm like, no, I don't believe you. That's a lie. 
Because what the enemy tries to do is he tries to get the shroud of insecurity to stop you from walking in the purpose that God has for you. Because if you're a writer and you just start writing and then you see things are great and when someone says you're a great writer, your mentality is like, I'm just doing this naturally. And because God is showing you that that's your gift, that's your ability, that's your talent that God has given you, but also your identity as a mighty warrior. You may not feel like it, but remember that God calls you even if you don't feel like it. And God is saying, you are a mighty man of God. You are a mighty man of valor. You're a mighty woman of valor. I've called you to great things. You might not be there yet, but it's like putting on a big sweater. And for those people that want to work out or get into bodybuilding, they say, I'm going to wear a big sweater so that I can grow into it. I may not fit it yet, but I will grow into it. There are some people here where God is saying the same thing, but that identity and that insecurity always comes from a lack of faith in who God is because you're looking in who you aren't instead of looking at who God is. Oh, man, I'm getting fired up. I'm sorry. But <laughs> here we read, every man stood in his place. Uh, let's give God some praise. Okay, okay. We just got to give it up. Here we read, every man stood in his place, and this is where we need to dis be able to distinguish the difference between opportunity and assignment. Because the world will tell you, take every opportunity you can, and that's where I bring that same question, where if God gave you that dream job, and it was the exact job that you wanted, but God said no, would you be able to say no to the opportunity so that you can stay faithful to the God-given assignment that he gave you? Because what the enemy tries to do is if he can't destroy you or discourage you, he will distract you from things you shouldn't be doing. He will distract you with a relationship you shouldn't be in. He will distract you even with a fear of a relationship that you maybe shouldn't have. But God wants us to take our place in society to dismantle its false gods. Because God's people are called to shape culture, not to cave, not to, cave to culture. And as we move obediently, God moves mightily. And once we can do that and start taking our place to fulfill God's assignment, then the next thing we need to do is maintain a pure focus on God and resist spiritual amnesia. It says, And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare, or in other words, a trap, to Gideon and to his family. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Barret their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. So this should be a warning for all of us, because once we start stepping in obedience and once we see God move mightily, there will always be that temptation to start looking back at self and forget who actually got you to that place in the first place. So after experiencing victory, Gideon and the next generation backslid into idolatry whether it's idolatry in money or even idolatry in your own self-strength or your own self-sufficiency. And then they again compromised by caving to the surrounding culture. This perpetuated a cycle of evil, corruption, and divine correction. And this has been the arc of human history, and we're at that place now. As we can see, our founding fathers framed our constitution upon the word of our heavenly father. They framed the rule of law on the word of God. And if any of you have a dollar bill right now in your wallet and you pull it out and you look at the back of the dollar bill, it says, in God whom we trust. But yet there's, there came to a season and there came to a time where truth and sin, it got blurred. And I'm not going to say I'm at the far left or the far right. I'm not going to say I'm Republican or Democratic right now here on this stage. But I'm going to say instead of far left or far right, I'm far up. Before I'm even a citizen of the United States of America, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I know that whether if I like the people who are in the authoritative role right now, I am called as a Christ follower and a Christian to pray for the person in that office. And that is my conviction, and I'm going to stand on it. And God is calling all of us to do the same thing. And we have to remember that his blessing will continue to follow us as we continue to follow him. So we need to stay focused Keep them first and don't stray. And we see in Psalm chapter 33, verse 10 through 12, it says, The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, and the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people he chose for his inheritance. Now, as I kind of bring this section to a close, 
I'm going to go ahead and share a story of how I even came here to Pearlside Church. It was actually known as Grace Bible before. Um, I ended up moving here about, I think it was three years, two years ago now, and I attended this thing called the Experience. It was called the Internship, and I was there for about a year, and within that time of the internship, I was serving under two different, uh, there was two churches partnered up, and I was serving under the other church that wasn't Grace Bible, which is now Pearlside, and at that time, it was a great time. I was finding out my gifts. I kind of felt like Gideon. I was like, felt like God was calling me as a mighty man of valor, but I didn't know exactly where he was leading me yet. Until the second semester of the internship, I come back from L.A., and I get a text message from this guy. I don't know if you know who he is, but his name is Pastor Russell Tolentino. And he sends me a text, and he says, hey, man, uh, you want to grab some Jamba Juice? And I'm like, uh, you never really talk to me except when we're actually doing some physical exercises during our workouts because we had this whole little training regimen for our class. But I said, why not? I'll get me a free Jamba Juice. And... Uh, <laughs> And we sit down at the Jamba Juice, and he gets me a peanut butter mood trying to get me in the mood. And, <laughs> and he sits me down, and he asks, just, he asks me this question. He just says, hey, man, um, how, how do you feel about maybe just praying about joining, joining our college young adults executive team as our kind of evangelist, or in other words, the person that would just reach students on the college campuses and allow them to come to know who Jesus Christ is? And I said, okay, cool, awesome, awesome, that's great. And um, I said, is there anything else? And he said, no, that's it. And I was like, huh, that's kind of, uh, okay, that's kind, of, that's kind of bland. There's no real, like, clear-cut road to where I feel like God wants me to go. But I said, let me pray about it. And to be honest, I wasn't really going to pray about it. I was going to put it in my pocket and leave it there forever. But two weeks later, I ended up getting asked by the pastor that I served under during the internship. And he asked me, he said, what are you going to do after you graduate the internship? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, the reason why I'm asking is, is because once you graduate, our plan for you is to offer you a full-time job with us here at the church, being paid a full-time paid salary guaranteed with benefits, with 401k, with even PTO. And then also he said, you're going to have preaching opportunities. You're going to be able to travel the world. And also after four years, we're going to send you out to plan your own church and we're going to fund half of that. And then I said, great, God, you are so good. Hallelujah. I know that's why I was placed here. And I said, what a great opportunity. And then two weeks after that, I was offered that, offered that job and offered that opportunity. I felt led. I got a prompting in my spirit to come to this thing called the Every Nation Campus Conference. And, it was, and who here has been to the Every Nation Campus Conference, ENC Conference? As you know, it is fully lit, right? Come on. But I ended up feeling led to go. And I asked Russell, I said, hey, well, how can I serve? What can I do at this conference? And he said, all you need to do is just connect with the students and just receive and just have a good time. And I said, okay, cool. Bet. I'll go. And, and I went, and it was a fantastic time, but I didn't realize that going into a church where I was completely, it was completely unfamiliar, it was completely uncertain, I pretty much knew no one except Russell and Chantel and maybe a few other people. But within those two days, God led me to pray over 50 college students and young adults to the point where Chantel Tolentino was asking me, she was like, man, Lexon, how many people did you pray for? And I said, I don't know, what do you mean? And she showed me a, a bunch of pictures of people posting me on their IG of me praying for some random people. And my first response was like, man, that's, you got, they got to pay me for that. That ain't free. What you doing posting my face on that? That's my moneymaker. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I repent. But at that point, I got this little prompting. And I realized that even when you want to confirm, when you want to get confirmation for where God is leading you, I realized I needed it from a pastoral father figure, kind of like Pastor Billy. And because I remember that day, I walked up to Pastor Billy and I said, hey, man, can we talk? And then we sat down and he asked me, he said, okay, well, why do you feel like you're feeling called here when you already have this great opportunity? And I shared with him the reason and he gave me some sound insight and some sound wisdom. And he said, don't go off the hype of a conference. Maybe give it two weeks, but if you still feel the same way, then maybe it might be God. And if you end up waking up at 3.30 in the morning in a cold sweat, that might be really God. And I ended up waking up at 3.30 in the morning that next week in a cold sweat, and I had this sentence in my head. And it said, wherever you go, I will follow you. I had no idea what that meant, so I Googled it, and it was actually an Every Nation music worship song. And I was like, come on, God. I was reluctant. 
I was that reluctant type of Gideon leader. But then what I did was I ended up talking to the pastor and I said, hey man, I think God is leading me here. He told me to pray about it. So I ended up casting my own fleece. I ended up going to Nimitz Beach over on the west side and I sat there for eight hours. Literally eight hours. And for seven and a half hours, I got nothing. It was completely silent. And I said, God, come on, I get it. You're testing my patience. But God, I just need a confirmatory sign. And then right when I say that, I look up and I see a G-shaped cloud in the sky. And my first reaction was, God, that can't be for Grace Bible. I don't want to go. <laughs> That's literally what I told God. I said, I don't want to go there. It doesn't make sense. It's too scary. It's too daunting. And then I, and then I was just like Gideon and I asked for a second sign. I was stubborn. I was scared. I was fearful. So I said, God, okay, one more sign. If you really give me one more sign, I will follow you where you lead me. And then he said, call this guy named Raul Ortiz. And Raul Ortiz was the reason why I'm here today. He's a pastor in LA that served with Pastor Billy. And he told me about the internship, but I called him. And I said, hey, Raul, man, I need some, I need some advice. And he said, what do you need? And I said, I have these two issues. I have, I have two great opportunities, but I got to find out what God's assignment is. And then he said, well, I could see why you want to go to that other church. It's safe. But let me ask you this. Why do you feel led to Grace Bible in every nation? And I said, I don't know, man. I think realizing and reflecting back on it, when I was saved at the age of 21 years old at college age, and a Uber driver came into my life and pulled me out of the pit of darkness I was living in, I realized that God also gave me another confirmatory sign two months after I got saved where I was in a public restroom. And on the mirror, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but it said, hey, as common courtesy for the person that's coming behind you, can you wipe the sink and leave it better than you found it? I didn't realize that God was telling me as a common courtesy for the generation coming behind you, can you leave this place better than you found it? And I realized right at that moment, that was my sign. And he said this, he said, now you already know what to do. So don't hesitate and just do it and have the hard conversations you need to have and get it done and walk in faith. Because what God had to do is he had to prune my self-strength. He had to prune the finances, the salary, the guaranteed paid position that would lead me right to where I want to go. And he said, I'm going to lead you into uncertainty so that you can find your certainty in me. There are some people sitting here today that have a big decision to make. There are some people sitting here today that God might be calling you to step higher. God might be telling you to step back in and stop hesitating and stop stepping in faith and watch him move. And some of you might, might just need to ask for confirmation again. Some of you might just need to set out your fleece and ask God saying, God, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? And once God says yes, then God, then the responsibility is on us, right? God wants to partner with us in the Great Commission to make disciples, to make a change in the culture, to make a change on the campus, to make a change in the marketplace. But the only one that will disqualify you from seeing God's promise be, promise be fulfilled in your life is yourself. Does that mean it's always going to be clear? No. Does that mean that God is always going to take you to exactly where you want to go? Not really. Because God doesn't care about the blessings, but he cares about your formation of character. He cares about the person you become more than the person that steps into a nice career or gets a nice job or moves to a nice place. And I feel like God is saying for all of us to take your place this year. We need to take our place to be the church and to be men and women of conviction, not men and women of compromise. To be men and women that will stand in truth even when it might offend others. In love, in grace, and in mercy, but not in compromise, not in fear of the world, because now is the time to rise up and instead of just being like the spotless lamb, be the lion of Judah. Instead of just having compassion, God is saying, be courageous. Instead of saying, just be meek, God is saying, be strong, but not in yourself, but in him. To not go back to idolatry of self-strength, but go back to worship and to God's power. Because God wants to use you. God wants to use us. God wants to use us to change the world. But we need to make sure that we're stepping in faith, not being reluctant leaders and not hesitating, but saying, God, we're going to do it. And we're not going to do it on our strength, but we're going to do it on yours. 
But we know that in order to become a Gideon or in order to become that reluctant leader or in order to become that mighty man and woman of God, it comes with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one that died on that cross for you and rose again three days later so that you can come into God's presence, not as an orphan, but as a beloved son and daughter.